everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. I'd like to introduce Kate Campbell. She's going to be one of our speakers, along with Andrew Sorsen. Kate comes from a family of dog breeders. She was a breeder of merit in three breeds, the Senjis, most well known for Ibiza towns, and perhaps surprisingly, also Kudus. She is a breeder of over 150 titles. Katie has been involved in 100 plus Basenji winners over the past 30 years. Her Taji breeding program is consistently ranked in her breeds top 10 to 20 in both Basenjis and Ibiza towns. She's been a parent club group mentor for 25 years. Re recently, she has also um, been the representative of the Basenji Club of America as their AKC delegate and serves on the AKC Breeder Development Committee. This year, Katie was honored enough to be asked to judge both the IDs and the Senate National Specialties. And thank you again for everybody watching tonight. You're on, Katie. Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, I have Years ago, when I started breeding, I was one of those people that really liked to check the boxes. I really was, I've always been a real type A type of person. And I, I needed to get something that was kind of concrete so that as I evolved as a breeder, I had something tangible that I could work with like a framework. So I put together this, what we call it, what I call the Taji technique, which is my kennel name. And um, it, I think it'll work over the course of other breeds because it's worked for me when I'm working on other breeds. So as I get started, I wanna just gloss over a couple of things with vocabulary because I wanna make sure that everybody understands what, how I'm using the words that I'm using. So phenotype, phenotype means that when you're looking at the dog, it's what it looks like, as opposed to genotype, which is something that's coming in through their physical genes. So genotype and phenotype. What we see is phenotype. When we're judges in the ring, we judge on phenotype. You know, and breeders are more concerned, of course, not only about phenotype, but also genotype, because we're able to run tests and things like that that um, help us breed the most healthy dogs we can. I'm gonna talk about assets and liabilities, and it's very much like a balance sheet. We're talking about what the assets and the strengths are of the animal versus the liabilities, which is commonly called a fault, but I hate to fault judge, so I like to consider them more of a liability. Um, objective versus subjective. Objective is like when you get a test, um, you get a numerical test result, like what the number is on an, uh, um, a, a um, pre progesterone test, you get a number that's not subjective, that's an objective number versus the subjective, which is when the judge makes a choice in the ring that's um, somewhat subjective of how the judge is interpreting your standard. Inbreeding versus outcrossing versus line breeding. Quickly to me, inbreeding is, to me, means really tight, like father, son, uh, or father, daughter, mother, son, litter uh, litter mates, that type of thing, I consider inbreeding. Outcrossing is when you see nothing on, there's no other common ancestors on a four generation pedigree, and that's just me. And then line breeding is when you see the same dog come up multiple times on four to five generation pedigree, like maybe three, four times, at least two. Um, so, you will hear different people talk about having different values on those words and it's kind of, there's no concrete way to interpret it. I'm also going to talk about fix versus correct in when we're looking at um, changing something in a dog. Correct means we've got something that's a liability and we're trying to correct it. And fix, what to me fix means, fix is when you're, you're really pushing a particular trait and you want to lock it in, you're going to fix it so it's going to stay consistent. Get is what, it, what a, 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 the, the children of a stud dog is get and produce is the 
uh, children of a dam. Um, and then I'm, I hope everybody in the room knows how to read a horizontal pedigree, and if not, we'll talk about that. I'll talk about anybody with that, about that later. And a vertical pedigree are the siblings of the dogs on the horizontal pedigree that you don't see. Vertical pedigrees are really important too. And then of course there's having an eye for a dog. And that's kind of the artistic visual of seeing something in a dog that is, that is cultivated. Few people are bored with it. Most people are lucky to cultivate it. So that being said, um, the first thing that I think is the most important thing to do is to read your standard with fresh eyes. Pretend like you've never seen it before. Sit down and read it with a cup of coffee on a slow Sunday morning and um, highlight the key points. Take heed of what the disqualifications are, of course, and um, choose, uh, choose what you think are the most important points of that, that standard. Also, then I go back and I circle words that have strong implications like should or must, and yet if, if they say must not have something and then not have a DQ, you know that it's not uh, desirable. So once you've read your standard with fresh eyes, you check, you just kind of check your emotions at the door. Don't, um, you have to be objective. Um, it's the assessment of the bitch that you intend to breed. And you need to take a look at, at your bitch and think, I'm going to evaluate the phenotype of my bitch. Use words from the standard directly to talk about what it is that you have that are assets on the bitch. And make sure that you are the worst critic that you can be what you don't come up with to critique your own stock, judges and your competition will do it for you. So learn how to do it for yourself. It's always easier to accept and digest and be honest about it when you will come forth with that on your own. So it's really important to stay objective and not be emotional when you're, you're evaluating your stock. So then what I do is I make a really simple chart and we were gonna have an overhead tonight. And then I had my whiteboard and then all four of my dry erase markers are dry. So um, um, I can pass this around if you wanna see it or you know we'll show it to the Facebook audience here really quickly. But it's a matter of just, you know, you put Susie Q at the top and then just here. So you just like put Susie Q at the top, and then you put assets underneath Susie Q and liabilities under Susie Q, and then you let you list these assets of Susie Q, and then you come up to her liabilities. Some of you may want to call it faults. I prefer to say liabilities, and you list the liabilities of Susie Q. Okay, now you've got that set up. And now you go back and you take a look at her pedigree, horizontal pedigree. As we know, each generation that goes back, you know, you've got each parent is worth 50%, grandparents 25, great grands 12 and a half, right? So go to each of those dogs on the pedigree of your own bitch and say, what are the same thing? What are the assets and liabilities of each of those dogs? and just simply go through it as if you were judging that individual that shows up on your pedigree. So now you've got that list on that. And if you don't know all of those dogs, you've not seen them before, you need to start researching because nobody's gonna hand you this just right over. Go call up those people, find out who they are, reach out to them, find out who owned that dog and have a telephone conversation with them. Ask them about, you know, super stud dog boo boo head. What was, you know, what was so great about him? What did you like the most? When he was used at stud, what did he throw? What did he not throw? What do you think is really important in a bitch that was bred to him? These types of things. And get that data for as many dogs on that pedigree as you can. 
out of the 64 dogs on the uh, on a um, five generation pedigree, the more dogs and the deeper your data is on this particular step, the the, the better the, the more information you're going to have to move forward. So then um, then the next thing that I do is I take I go back to my bitch and I've got all of these other you know assets and liabilities of all these dogs around her. Then I can say, okay, from her assets list, I can split that assets list and say, here are the asset points that she is genetically prepotent for. Because here, all of, you know, several of these grandparents and great grandparents behind her had those had those assets. So she's genetically prepotent for her pretty head or her good coat or her um, thick pad feet or whatever it is. She's genetically prepotent for that. And then you make another column that the rest of those in her asset column are going to be her genetically subordinate assets, meaning she got lucky. She's got this asset. She possesses it, but you can't really show that it's coming strongly through her pedigree. She just got lucky. Now you go through the same thing on the liabilities list. You go see what she's genetically, her genetically prepotent liabilities. You've got a whole bunch of low tail sets. If you don't want a low tail set in your breed, my my breeds have you know one, two of my three breeds have higher tail sets. You go and you're looking for a a, a a proper tail set, and if you've got, or I'm sorry, you've got poor tail sets behind you, you're going to be prepotent for that. And then there's also the genetically subordinate liabilities. And this is sort of the list of wow, where did that come from? You know, you can have two dogs that, you know, you think are going to be perfect and they're strong for certain things, but then the individual that you wound up with didn't, didn't get that feature and got a fault instead. You, the more, the deeper you go back on that pedigree with making those assets and liabilities list, then you're going to see where it came from. Take notes of all of this work that you do. Study photos and archives. Ask longtime breeders. Um, and this will help put it together for you of what, where the genetics are with the phenotype that you see in front of you. Consistent or fluke. Features that are repeated, you can assume that, he, that she, you know, she is prepotent for those assets and liabilities, of course. And those that seem to have come out of nowhere or lack information, you know, are the ones that are um, more fluky. So when you put all of this together, in essence, what you're doing is you're creating your essential stud dog shopping list. You're now taking a look at this asset and liabilities list of what she's genetically prepotent for in both assets and liabilities, and you can see which liabilities you must correct, and if it's if she's prepotent for those, you want to be breeding to a stud dog that is particularly potent for correcting that fault. So that um, when you're creating that list, I'd say probably you know your top three, uh, the the top three things that you have in your liabilities that are important that you wish that you could correct. The stud dog that you're going to must possess those three things. And even though you may really adore the eye shape of your bitch, and she may be very prepotent for that eye shape, and it's so important that you get that eye shape going forward, if she's genetically prepotent for it, you can probably make the risk and wager of breeding to a stud dog that really has what you need and don't worry so much about the genetic strength that she has. Also, the, um, in the same breath, you, the, the top three things that your, um, that your bitch has as liabilities, you want to make sure that he does not have those, and especially genetic prepotency for them. Be aware that if he has an asset that you're looking for, but he's not genetically prepotent for it, 
and you needed that feature, you're unlikely to get it from that dog. Does that make sense? So now you've got now you've got this list and you know where it comes from. You've really studied every dog on your pedigree. You know what you're looking for. Now what do you do? Now you go shopping, the actual shopping finally. And best that you go and you attend your national specialty, the large regional specialties, go to as many as you can, pledge to sit ringside and pay attention all day long. Watch the whole thing. Take notes in the catalogs that you get. Make notes in the margins about particular dogs. If you have the opportunity to have your national specialties or regional specialties streamed, go get them, review them. You know, before we had streaming, we had DVDs. Maybe your club has copies of them in their archives. If you're a member of your parent club, you might be able to literally, you know, check it out like a library. Bring it home. See these dogs that lived 20 years ago that are on your pedigrees. Um, I really encourage you to take real notes on going further back. Um, it's not enough to look at parents. It's not enough to just look at grandparents. You have to go at least to the great grandparents and in order to keep more mystery out and have more certainty, you've got to go back to great, great grands. Um, I always encourage people to stay away from the dog of the day, who's ever really famous in the common time, the dog that everybody's breeding to, the one that is having a lot of money thrown at it to be shown, um, that isn't at all necessarily what's best for you. If you study your pedigree and you get these kinds of notes and you create the shopping list that I'm proposing, you're very clear and you're very articulate when you're going to look and you will really blow away some stud dog owners when you can be this articulate about what you're looking for. It, as a newer breeder and a younger breeder, if you're coming along and you can speak to the assets and liabilities that you're after and what you've researched and what you know, then um, whatever, you're, whatever you wind up deciding on and what your plan is, you're gonna win the respect of many breeders in your breed, which will only help you go further. Because most people just breed to what's winning, what's easy for them to breed to, who, you know, their friend owns the dog. That is sadly the bulk of what a lot of the breedings happen. And in order to become a really great breeder, to become a master breeder, you need to be able to have your own ideas and know why you're doing what you're doing, why you make the choices you make, and then you need and you get to own it. Um, a tip that I'd like to share with you, and this is something that I've told numerous people. People come up to me and say, oh, I have my Susie Q bitch. Katie, who do you think I should breed Susie Q to? And I'd say, well, you know, have you done some homework? What do you think you want to do? And I said, I'm not going to tell you who you should breed Susie Q to. If I told you who to breed Susie Q to, and then you take my advice, then I'm the breeder on that litter. I'm the one who thought about it. It's not you. If you want to own that glory, and trust me, it's glorious to be, to have these bred by champions and to really produce well. It's, it's, it's a thrill. You, you don't earnestly own that unless you do this homework yourself and you come up with those, your choice on pretty much on your own with the advice of searching out the people behind you on the pedigrees. So you come up with your dog, always have a backup stud lined up and always be very clear to the person that you're my backup stud. I've already chosen so and so, and I don't. I, I'm I'm choosing him for these reasons. But if I can't fly my bitch out when she's in season because there's a snowstorm on the east coast, then you have something else that's available to you. This is also another really good time to always have some theory of. of a backup decision with frozen semen, and I, I know that Anders will speak to that soon. But 
frozen semen, if you've done your progesterone all the way through, like most of us should, I do, then if you you can pivot, you can go from having a fruit, from doing live cover, you can pivot and go do fresh extended or frozen. Um, also with stud service, always make sure you have a written stud service agreement. Everything's really nice until something goes wrong. And it's a terrible thing. Some people are giggling over here because you know what I'm talking about. The best of intentions can uh, go, and friendships can go sour if you don't have a stud service agreement. So always make sure it's there. Think about all of the what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? And just make those as points into it. Doesn't need to be done by an attorney. It doesn't need to be that. It's really more because you know when it comes to dogs and agreements, most of it is just you know the the character of the person. But at least at the time of the stud service agreement, these were the points that were agreed, and everybody signs for it. Also, if you're in, if you co-own the stud or the bitch with it, somebody else, make sure that they're named and are known to be in it as well. Um, so um, the only other quick thing is just having an eye for a dog. Just in brief, one thing I wanted to add, people ask me about that a lot. And I think that it's something that comes over time. But if you really want to get an eye for a dog, it goes back to some more basic things about design. Spend some time in the museum. Take a look at how, um, um, like what we were talking about at the table earlier today, perspective. You know, what happens artistically when something is moved, when you see something from left to right, close up and far away. Those types of, you know, cultural enrichment will definitely help your dog game. Um, and I think that that's part of what brings an eye for a dog. Balance, cohesiveness, the synergy that happens when after you check off you know, all of these things that you want to have and you can check the box, check the box, check the box. The next thing is, does it all fit together with synergy where the dog is actually, you can see why the standard is written the way it is because when all of those parts work together in balance and harmony, it's, it's, it makes for a beautiful dog. So all that being said with phenotype and, and such, it's the breeder's responsibility to bring to the judges the most healthy dogs and the dogs that are going to be able to move forward and represent the breed in the future. And so much of that is with the new health testing that we have available to us and to make sure that you have a veterinarian on your team who has experience and interest in theriogenology. So with that, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Andrew Thorson, who um, I remember from when he was just a tiny tot showing his junior showmanship and growing up and um, he was outstanding in, as a junior handler and always so kind to everyone. And when he aged out of juniors and went off to college and then chose to go into veterinary medicine, there were many of the local breed, cl breed clubs and all breed clubs in the area who were more than happy to donate to his, um, his, his scholarships to help him along through vet school. And we were all so pleased that as he graduated, he didn't forget all of those of us that he learned to love the dogs and the animals with. And he has taken a bright interest and great talent in theriogenology, which is the study with breeding and reproduction. So um, we're all so tickled to have him. Oh, and I'll just one last plug because you probably won't say this for yourself. With having a... Um, when you choose the vet that you're working with, if you're going to work in frozen and fresh, make sure that you're not just working with simply the local vet that you've always had that you trust, because they probably don't know squat about theriogenology. They don't teach enough about it in basic vet school, and it really takes somebody like Anders, who has taken an interest and studied further. So I'll let him talk all about that, but thank you for having us, and we'll take questions after he's done. That was, that was great, uh, really cool information and good um, 
good to hear about you know looking at the dog phenotypically and then you, know, you touch a little bit about the genotype there doing the genetic testing and so you know that's one thing that i'm really proud of at our clinic is that we, we require dogs to be genetically tested um as according to what the breed club would would want um for that and if people don't do it then we say okay you can go to somebody else and you know that may be a harsh reality but you know in uh in the veterinary medicine field at least there's very few people and fewer and fewer every day who want to work with breeders and i think part of the issue with that is uh it needs to be put on on breeders ourselves as well um, because the, I'm a big believer in the only thing you can control is yourself. And at vet schools, they're not huge into breeding. They think that everything um, that's purebred has diseases, um, when in reality, um, mixed breeds have just as many diseases as they just don't track them. Um, and so as breeders, I think our job is to change the mindset. And so when you're working with your veterinarian, be their best client when you are you know make sure your dogs are really well groomed and taken care of when you bring them in so that they don't think oh this breeder's dogs smell bad or these breeders dog they don't take care of their dogs they have too many dogs you want to so that that's my biggest advice is just be the best client instead of trying to be somebody that and then you can develop that relationship with that veterinarian and then, yeah, finding someone that wants to, that has an interest in it, because right now I get calls all the time from veterinarians who know very little about the very basic things that they should know with breeding, like progesterone values, whether they should be high or low. Um, whether, I mean, it's just kind of stuff that, you, that as breeders, you already know all that information. Um, and so the techniques have changed a lot. Um, and in the U.S. now, we're, we're doing more and more with um, artificial insemination. They've developed um, a lot of techniques in other countries due to limitations on surgery. So um, frozen semen used to be uh, limited to um, surgical only. Now we have TCI in this country, which um, has in probably the last 10 years have become really, really prevalent. In other countries, it's illegal to do a surgical AI. So they've developed this technique um, and it's very, very successful. Um, but speaking about frozen semen, we have to be careful about what do we know about what is stored. Um, because what I see is I'll often get a breeding unit. They say it's um, you know 75% progressively modal, which I highly doubt when they say that. And then I'll thaw it out, and there'll be 15 million sperm in there. And you need for a large dog, you need about 200 million. And so we need to figure out what is a breeding unit? What is something, what do they, so all the information we can get from that entity that is freezing it, and some are very good and some are not. And it's really hard to know, you know, what you have unless you have the original paperwork and see what was the sperm count, what were, um, what were the things, um, you know, that, that they did at the time. And then a post-thaw 85% makes me really skeptical because most of them are 40% or less in all reality. So it's just trying to figure out, you know, what do you have? Um, I think we're finding more of this because now more people are using frozen than ever before because we have access to it. So people froze dogs 30 years ago, um, which is really cool when you get, you know, puppies out of a dog that, that died 30 years ago, died before I was born, right? I mean, that's pretty cool. And you're like, whoa. Um, and, uh, and these breeders are getting great puppies out of these dogs that go way back to their stuff from, from then. It's just we have to know what we're, what we're getting into. And then having a backup, like you talked about, is huge. Whether it be fresh, you know, or frozen, or all, all kinds of crazy things happen. In fact, the other day we had a stud dog that was, somebody flew up here to be bred, and the stud dog passed away just unexpectedly oh. overnight, the day it was supposed to be collected. Oh, so they had a backup left, and they were able to get that. And it's just one of these things that's, you know, it, it, you can't you can't expect that to happen. It just it just did, and you know, it's just one of those unexpected things. So. Yeah, I don't have a lot else besides that. I know there's some questions, or you know, that was kind of the, the thought we were thinking here. So. Yeah. yeah, so can you uh, talk about um, how if somebody's going to do progesterone, 
Sorry. And process from tests. And, you know, ideally you'd like to have it done every day, but that's not going to be, you know, worthwhile for, that, that's not going to be practical for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, is there any kind of rules of thumb that you can offer with the numbers or when it's important to start or how long do you go, how long do you keep testing on your test room? So the question is about progesterone testing, how often to do it, uh, and you know how, how long we do it. And so part of it is going to someone that knows how to interpret their machine and how to judge when to do the next one. Because it is sometimes we are guessing as far as, you know, if a dog comes in and it's 0.3, you're not going to do it the next day. Or I wouldn't do it the next day. Um, but then you're also looking at holidays, weekends, and all kinds of stuff because you also have to keep in mind if you're shipping or where the semen's coming from when you need to get it there. You don't want it there too early. So, you know, if someone comes to me on Wednesday with a point three, I'm going to say, well, we should do one Friday because if we don't have the number and it jumps to one, you know, and part of it's, you know, how long has the bitch been in heat? You know, typically we like to draw the first progesterone about the first five to seven days assuming we caught them when they came into heat. <laughs> um, because we have plenty of dogs that have silent heat or they're very quiet about it, and we drop progesterone and it's 15, mm -hmm. then we've missed ovulation. Um, the other thing is just to keep track of what units are being used. There's some machines that um, use nanomoles per liter, which is you know, your higher values. Those are gonna be um, often in Canada or at the, the Mini Vetus machine. Or if you're using like a lab like IDEX, or um, then you're going to be looking at like your five is your population. <laughs> and so, some, so, so if someone says, oh, my dog was at five, it's like, well, what were the units? Because that's nanograms per mil. Or if, if it's nanomoles, then they have not really yet. So it just, you got to keep that all into perspective. And so, you know, I try and, I try and pinpoint ovulation, um, but I also try and get LH if we can. So the LH surge happens 48 hours before ovulation. I mean, they're pretty set on that. So for our frozen breeding, we really like to catch that if we can. Usually your progesterone value is going to be about two. So if I see a two, I usually run an LH if, if the owner approves it. If I get a 1.7, I probably want a progesterone the next day. Um, and part of it's going to depend on the bitch's cycle if you know your history. You don't always have that information. Um, and then I do like to see it. Um, if we're doing any kind of artificial insemination, I do like to see it get to 20 or greater. Because you know then that they've risen, they've continued to rise, and their progesterone should be at 20 for the duration of the pregnancy. Actually, it'll be at 20 for the duration of the dog um, until it would have whelped, even if it's not bred. Um, and so that's kind of a, a weird thing about dogs, is it'll stay high, and then when they're about to whelp, that's when it drops down. Yeah. TCI versus surgical, um, and then kind of a follow-up about from a stud dog perspective, you know, shipping on those. So, kind of a rule of thumb is the dog ovulates when they ovulate. You breed them at the same time, whether they, you know, because they ovulate, and it takes 72 hours for the eggs to become mature. As far as a stud dog owner, your job is to ship the semen when they tell you. Right? Um, you try and think ahead for them, but the problem is I've had people where the stud dog owner said, nope, that's not the right day. And by the way, we missed the bitch because we wanted to see him in a day earlier. Um, so really, you ship it when they ask. You can have a conversation with them, but really if they ask for it, you get it shipped. Um, now, if they need some mentoring and some help, that's fine. If their vet doesn't know what they're doing, that, that's another thing. But it's really, yeah, it, it makes it challenging from a stud dog perspective. And I try and keep it as a simple business tra transaction is that when they ask for it, you do your darndest to get it there. Now, you have shipping errors with FedEx, UPS, you name it. 
Um, but your job is to get it out as as best you can. Um, as far as numbers, um, transcervical insemination has become much more popular. It really does depend on the person doing it. They have to do a lot of that because it takes a long time to figure out how to do it and the variations. There's very few that can't be done, but there are some. Um, but most of the time it just takes experience doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it over and over again. Um, for people that are very proficient at it, the odds of pregnancy, especially with frozen semen, go up, opposed to surgical. It's about 80% um, with frozen semen. The reason being, at least what we think the reason is, is that you don't have anesthesia, you don't have recovery, you don't have inflammation from the surgery site. Um, but I will admit, there are some bitches that for whatever reason they get pregnant on a surgical when they didn't on a TCI. I can't explain that necessarily. Um, yeah, the, the reason the reason to do a surgical is you can visualize the uterus, you can visualize the ovaries, and see things that you miss otherwise. So that would be a reason to do it. You can break up cysts and things like that. Um, but there's you know, a theory genologist in. Um, Australia that I talked to, who all he does is reproduction, um, very successful practice. He has not done a surgical insemination in five years, and he's so very very successful. But that's yeah, that's Australia, right? So, um, but but at the same time, um, I mean that's so so the numbers are are changing, and I think skill level has a lot to do with it because if you don't get through the cervix, you did not do a TCI, right. you did an AI. Which is fine, and it's just that's the, the reality of it. Very rarely am I actually, you know, most of the time I just do TCIs or surgicals now because owners can mostly do your regular vaginal EIs. Um, or, you know, I, I'm happy to do it. It's just, you know, most people just have me do the, the, the more advanced stuff. So, did I answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So um, I have a question. I have a bitch who had one successful pregnancy. We did a surgical with frozen semen from 10 years prior. Um, she sat, had a successful pregnancy, three puppies. Um, and she has since then been bred twice. We have only done AIs. However, um, the stud dog has been proven with other bitches um, in between those breedings. Um, where would you start next? Like, what should I be? What should I be doing to do a workup to give her the best opportunity to make the next breeding successful? And I'm assuming progesterones were okay. Yes, progesterones. So one of the one of the heat cycles that she had was a very weird heat cycle, and she did not ovulate until day 21. Yeah. Um, she has had a history of having weird heat cycles. The, the pregnancy that took with the surgical with the frozen, everything was as normal as could be, um, and one of the two AI breedings with the fresh chill, I mean, it, it wasn't even fresh chill, he was there for one of the breedings, um, and one time it was fresh chill. Uh, one of those breedings was the one where she waited 20, close to 21 days to ovulate. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, she had a normal, you know, she ovulated around day 14, um, and, you know, she went well beyond, she was at least in the 15, you know, 15 yeah. number for progesterone. So we continue to make sure that it went up. So. Yeah, so it, I mean, it's always challenging when you have dogs that cycle sporadically as well yeah. or, or that have kind of weird cycles. And kind of it depends on, okay, how much do we want to breed this bitch? How much do we want to put into it? Yeah. In all reality, from just a pure economic yeah. standpoint, right? Sometimes it's like it's harder than it should be. Yeah. It's not worth it. Now, if it's yeah. really worth it for the breeding program, you're probably looking at um, potentially doing a biopsy of the uterus. The problem with doing a biopsy of the uterus is you can't breed them on that cycle. And that has to be when they you can't just do a biopsy at any time. It needs to be when they're in diastrus in, in all reality. So that means you skip a cycle. You're going in, you're getting a biopsy, you send it to a reproductive pathologist, um, going to be at either Ohio State or Cornell. Um, you don't want to just send it to any pathologist. Um, so, that, so then you're, I mean, they heal from that and all that stuff. In all likelihood, unfortunately, it comes back normal. Normal is good. Normal means that it's not bad. It means that, that there's a potential for her to get pregnant um, and that you're not wasting more time doing this. 
Um, but it does make it make it really hard. That I mean, that is a place to start. You know, I'm assuming that you've done full blood, you've done the thyroid panel, you've done all the stuff that you know your normal stuff. Um, and then, I mean, trying to look at how often are they cycling? Are they cycling, you know, every four months? Are they cycling every six months? Or is it eight? You know, that kind of yeah. thing. If it's four months, ideally we would push it. The hard part is now we're we don't have the access to check drops. So you can't stop the cycle like we used to be able to. It's an anabolic steroid and people have used it incorrectly, so now we don't have that. Um, so those, those are things that I'd be thinking about. The other thing you can do at the time of the biopsy is obviously look for cysts. Um, ultrasound can find some of that, but you need someone who's really good with the ultrasound um, to look for ovarian cysts and, and things like that. Um, usually, again, that's going to be best done when they're in, in heat because the ovaries are going to be a little bit bigger. You're going to see the cysts at that point, too. Uh, I mean, there's lots of things that you can do. The question is, how much do we do? How important is this bitch to the breeding program? Um, and that's where, yeah, I mean, each case is going to be a little different. <clears throat> Stacy asks, can you talk about detaching placentas? And I suspect they had one happen their last litter. And by detaching, are they talking resorption, do we know, or is it detaching? So typically placentas do detach at time of welding. Um, if you're doing a C-section, I try and get all the placentas out if possible, just so we don't um, have any sign of uh, any neutritis. As far as resorptive, um, usually you see resorption um, about the pregnancy ultrasound. Um, suspicion is that it's actually 25% of all litters have resorptions. Um, so you may see that, um, but when I see that on the ultrasound, I usually run a progesterone, one to make sure that it's high enough, that it continues to stay elevated. So it should be above 20 or, you know, should be 19, 15. If it's 15, I'm gonna run another one um, in a few days and just see where we're at, because if it continues to drop, then we think about supplementation. Um, the projection has to be about six to maintain a pregnancy. Um, and so, yeah, resorption uh, can happen. But I also usually put them on antibiotics because there's not a ton you can do at the time um, besides treat the treatable. That's what, that's what I tell people. Let's treat what we can. Let's get them on some antibiotics, get them, uh, see what the progesterone is. And then, um, and then usually I like to re ultrasound those to make sure that we're not seeing more and, you know, see if there's any changes going on there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, all placentas detach, I guess. So I, when I see stillborn puppies, I usually think, one, they were already dead, or they took too long coming out, would be my guess. So because the placentas, if, they, if they're detaching early, you're going to usually see green discharge, because um, basically the placenta is their, is their source of oxygen um, to, the, to the body. And so if, once that detaches, you only have a certain amount of time to get the puppy out whether that be via C-section or, or just a natural welding. Uh, but you also, I mean, I hear about those puppies all the time where people are like, oh yeah, it was 24 hours and I had the last one and it was alive. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> not very common, but you know, it's, hey, you get lucky and uh, you'll take those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's the, the, the placenta detachment is normal. And I guess if it's early, then that would be a concern. But um, yeah. Are there any more questions from the audience? Um, I'm going to check the powers that be. They're looking at the pure dog. Oh, I can see it. Can you? Is mm -hmm. there is there more? Mm. Nope. Stacy was the only one who posted one. Stacy was the only one who posted one. Okay. Anybody online? <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Anybody online have any more questions? Okay. 
I'm going to go with no. All right, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for coming and for